All right, wonderful. Okay, let's get started. I will let in people as they come in, uh, but we are at 2.15. Uh, welcome everyone to our roundtable uh, session uh, RO2, uh, Lessons for Online Instruction, Pivoting from COVID. Uh, our favorite word of the season, pivoting, right? Every, we seem to be pivoting in all different directions. Uh, we have wonderful speakers here today. Uh, starting, uh, this is our agenda. So we, um, as a group, uh, wanted to go for the format two, in which we will, uh, I will introduce the speakers and we'll have the three presentations, as you can see them listed on the screen. Uh, each presenter will have about 10 to 15 minutes to present. Uh, I will keep time and I will let you know when you uh, are going a little overboard so that we have some time for uh, discussion. Uh, the way we are uh, having our discussion today is uh, I have three breakout rooms uh, for each of these uh, sessions. And so you, as the audience, you can choose to go into these breakout rooms as freely as you want. Uh, I don't need to assign you. Uh, please just join the room that you're interested in and ask the question. The authors will be um, in the uh, breakout rooms and you would be able to ask them questions as you please. And you can move into other rooms uh, when you're done with that. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Rubaina Khan. I'm from University of Toronto, a PhD student at OISE. Uh, my research interests lie around engineering education and forming learning communities. And our first speaker today is uh, Andrea Cooperberg, Teresa Bergello, and Wilma Brown from John Abbott College. Uh, their title of their uh, presentation is Co-Modal High Flex Teaching and Learning at John Abbott College. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you folks can start sharing yours. Sure, thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. And hello, everyone. And uh, yes, welcome to our uh, afternoon discussion, certainly around how COVID has affected certain things. And we've got uh, three different presentations here this afternoon. Okay, so we'll begin. So hi, my name is Teresa Bergello. And um, so we're presenting on a, um, a special project that we started at John Abbott. And we were very fortunate to have had the funds to support the college to look into some, um, some preparation, if you will, to the post pandemic in terms of um, exploring ideas that would better prepare us for what what could be um, waiting for us after the pandemic. Um, we are expecting changes in student expectations. We're expect expecting changes as far as what uh, both university and industry will expect of our students once they leave. Um, and we're dealing with the idea too that post pandemic, we're still going to have situations. When I say post pandemic, I'm meaning this coming academic year. So we're not really completely out of the pandemic. Um, but we, we started this project with the idea of potentially looking at this as a way to accommodate students, um, as well as for uh, dealing with the potential for continued physical distancing. And finally, for exploring for future, um, for ways of offering to students courses in education um, by increasing accessibility through using uh, Comodal as one of the modes of delivery to do that. Um, so we started with this project. If we can go to the next slide, Andrea. Thank you. So people ask what is comodal, and uh, the other term that's often used is high flex. Um, so it is essentially where the teacher is still teaching in the classroom and on campus, but with some of the students from the class, while the balance of the students are um, participating remotely, but live or synchronously. Um, so the project that we started in doing this was to start to explore, as I said, this mode of delivery. And you'll see in the picture, um, just a snapshot of the participants and the classroom. Um, you can go to the next slide, um, Andrea, and into our um, steps of the project. 
So we started with the idea of, okay, well, where do we start? So we did a scan of the environment. Um, we uh, knew we would have to approach other CGEPs and other institutions to see what they were doing, um, take a scan of the research that was related to Comodal, and then from there, develop a plan with our, um, with our ITS staff and our PED counselors, so Andrea being one of them, and then we hired another professional, so Wilma, who's with us today, um, to assist us in the project. From there, um, it was an, um, quite an interesting um, next step of recruiting faculty, and this was a bit of a challenge in some ways, because there was some interest and a lot of interest, but we needed to choose faculty who wouldn't feel overwhelmed with the, with the, uh, the technology. And we ran some uh, pilots just this spring. So we had to get ourselves set up first. So that took some time. Um, next steps, of course, was um, having to first train the teachers in dealing with and managing the equipment, um, and then working with them and surveying them thereafter, along with the students, to get some feedback to further guide us in our planning for the upcoming fall and future semesters. And our, our idea is that this is going to be a continuous loop because we'll be um, continually seeking input and feedback from our participants. Um, to better um, to better our delivery in our future semesters. So next slide and Andrea will speak to our pilots. Thanks, thank you, Terry, and um, thanks everybody. My name is Andrea Cooperberg and uh, I really had the great um, opportunity to work with Teresa and uh, Willie on this project. And what you see in these slides is um, the steps in the planning, developing, and uh, doing this project. And we're now at, uh, in June. So we're here presenting at the conference, but at the same time, we had a training for teachers yesterday uh, with the teachers who did the pilot test, as Terry mentioned, and with new teachers that are willing to do it uh, during fall or also in the summer. And we're looking at next room setup, new equipment, um, adjusting any um, material documents for teachers. And uh, it's an ongoing pro project and pilot test. Um, so in this slide, um, we selected some visuals to give you an idea how we set up the classes. We use for the pilot test two different classes at the college. Um, and you see, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference in the setup. And as Terry mentioned, the first uh, screen capture that you see here was our first, first pilot test that we did with teachers. Uh, with the, some of the teachers who were interested uh, in Comodal and some of the teachers that we recruited um, at the college to have the uh, first experience among us. Uh, so this is one room. The second room that you see uh, is a teacher uh, in, her, in his classroom teaching commodely. So in the first room that I, I want to describe the difference. So until now we use a camera that uh, his, its name is uh, an owl. And it's a video and audio incorporated camera. So whenever somebody is speaking, it will follow and zoom uh, that that uh, particular uh, person that is talking. And it's gonna split, as you see in this first uh, square, the image um, usually in two. Uh, so the main speaker and another speaker. And so that was the, for one of the rooms that we experiment. And the second room uh, was a camera that was mounted on the ceiling. So you see uh, the students from uh, their back. Uh, you can see one of the students there. And uh, this camera has the ability to preset uh, zooms so the teacher can zoom, uh, have either this view of the whole class or zoom on one of, one of the whiteboards that is here or select another, another zoom, another preset zoom to use. Um, so teachers were very um, comfortable with this camp, with this setup. Uh, so we're looking to have more on this uh, camera in the ceilings. Uh, so in terms of the pilot test that Terry was mentioning, we have six teachers who did uh, uh, try the different uh, rooms. 
and they have the possibility uh, to do two or three tests for, uh, per teacher. And um, we have uh, 11 in total for one of the rooms, some four because we were equipped, we were on the way to equip the second room. And we did survey uh, the students as well as the teachers. And every time we finish uh, every pilot test, the teacher would fill out the survey and the students. Uh, so we have a lot of feedback from each uh, of one of them on each class uh, that you'll see now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pre preliminary results because we're, we are still working on the results and gathering data. That's that. This is to give you an idea. And as we go further, we're gonna keep serving, uh, doing surveys with the teachers uh, in the summer and in the fall. So the type of questions that we asked the teachers as well, the students were related to technology, of course, how they felt about it, and also about uh, pedagogy, how they felt included in the classroom. Uh, so in terms of technological aspects, uh, you see the audio and video, the feedback was very good uh, from the students' point of view. And then we ask how they felt, uh, if they feel felt that they participate fully in the class. And, and uh, we, we got a nice average here. And then how was the overall experience with, the, with this modality? Um, we gathered also uh, open-ended questions. We asked open-ended questions. So some of the students uh, uh, thought that they love the modality. They, they thought that online was, uh, it was more engaging even than having the typical online uh, class. Um, they felt like they, they felt here when they raised their hands. And uh, also from the point of view of the students who were in, on campus, they really enjoy coming, going back to the, to the campus. Some students were, it was the first time that, that they were there. So it was very, uh, you know, they, were, they felt very happy about that. And also some of them, they, it was the last class. So um, some of the students reported challenges when they worked in groups uh, because not a lot of people uh, were interested in participation in discussion, as you see. And it was hard for, especially for the online students. In terms of the teachers, um, we asked them how easy um, they found the use of the equipment. And um, in this case, note that the teachers did a, a couple of tests. So um, of course, the first time they felt more, uh, uh, they needed more supported. And as they went, as they went to the class for the second and third time, they felt more comfortable with the technology. They tried th different things. So they, they really felt like uh, uh, more uh, uh, comfortable with all the classroom setup and the way to teach. Um, so here, how they feel, how they feel they manage both groups in class and online. And also how they uh, feel indifferent. You see here the difference between how they feel the learning happened between the in-class students and online. Uh, which is a little bit lower. And um, they felt like they met the objective for the classes. And in overall, they, they, they like the Komodo teacher experience as you see in this uh, number. Some of the comments, so they, the teachers felt that they got, they, they got support. And we had the possibility to observe uh, every pilot test the teachers allows, allowed us to have uh, uh, in person or online. Uh, we went there and we support them as well. And they felt they covered the material. And they also felt like the challenge between the online students and on campus, because it's easy to uh, forget that you have an online group there on the on the monitor. And it's easy to concentrate on the students that are there with you. Uh, and also uh, they would like to, to the students to turn on the cameras more often, which we know that. And some teachers feel like having two classes simultaneously and 
this is what uh, what we're gonna talk with when we give you a little bit of best practices on on these topics on Comoros, because um, we based on the feedback um, we produce material on how you can best um, the suit for uh, teach for two classes that are one online and one on campus. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we have it. The teachers have a positive experience, the students as well. Uh, in fact, we have uh, the teachers who participated in the pilot test, they like to teach in the, you know, the summer and fall. Uh, even when we're still analyzing, we think we got meaningful feedback, which help us uh, review the equipment that we need, uh, what would be the best practices, and some of the tips that we're going to see with uh, Willie uh, later on is that the teachers feel, felt that they need to prepare all the material in advance, arrive early to the room to familiarize with equipment, and some of the strategies could be to, when you use breakout rooms, uh, mix the students who are online and uh, on campus, assign a chat monitor and visit the breakout rooms. And what they said is, you know, as an advice is to start small. So some teachers start the first, uh, the first uh, pilot test teaching, lecturing, and then by the second class, they were more uh, uh, familiar with that and they started testing and other things, breakup rooms, other strategies. So, yeah. I don't know how we are with time. <laughs> I think we need a few minutes from Willie to-, uh, to Yes. So maybe you wanna, uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, maybe you wanna unshare your screen so that Wilma can share hers. And you. Wilma, you have seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So we learned a lot of things over these last months, uh, read uh, some of the research papers that are out, and also just being very practical on campus at John Abbott with the equipment. How can we best help our students, some of them in class with a teacher and some of them online. So how can we best do that? So I'm going to start our presentation actually with a quick question for everyone. So think about one thing that you know about commodal teaching, just one thing. And I'm going to stop sharing because I'd like just to hear from a few people who are in our audience today. What do, what do you know about commodal teaching, high flex teaching? You're still sharing, Willie. Yeah, I see that. That's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get the right button. Anyone want to uh, just make a statement about what they know, what they don't know, what they're anxious about? What question do they have? Can I, uh, uh, students who are not uh, with you, I mean, with the teacher are not motivated. Okay, so you think there's a challenge with motivation? Okay, yes. fair enough. Excellent. Yes, Carmen? Hi, yeah, um, I guess my concerns is how to um, manage like group work when you've got one student, you know, online, no, sorry, mixing students online with students who are present and not having like feedback with the microphone, like technology. Okay, okay. We, we can deal with that in the breakout room, but there are certainly ways to do that. Anyone else just want to make one comment? Andrea? I just had another comment that, you know, as we were thinking about your know, students being in these different scenarios, how do I kind of ensure that I'm giving a homogeneous experience to all my students? That is one of the biggest challenges all around. So I'll continue with some of the best practices that we've come up with so far. I'll um, go through them rather quickly now, but once again, we can review them a little bit more in the breakout session. So thank you for everyone who was sharing and, and your comments. And there are positive and uh, ways to deal with all, all questions that were asked. So one of the things is as a instructor, as a teacher, you need to become comfortable and familiar with whatever equipment your institution has set up. 
So practice now, practice in August, practice before the, the classes begin and to test just as we do in Zoom to test microphones and, and cameras and um, know who to contact when things don't go so well. So you'll have uh, you know, IT support somewhere in your institution. To welcome every, so to address uh, one of the, uh, the comments that came up, you, you really need to make an effort to address everyone. You're in class with some students, depending on how many students, it, it could be a third of your class, a quarter of your class, half the class, and then you have at the same moment people online. So make sure that you address both groups and it is easy to forget about the people online. So. That's one thing that we're really encouraging you to uh, think about and to work on as you, and it's, it's a learning process as a teacher to actually do this well. We encourage that you also solicit two online students, one to monitor the chat and the other to the raised hands, because when you're teaching and you've already got a group in front of you, you need to look at the camera, you need to look at the people in front of you, you need to look at the students that are online, and look at their images as well, which won't necessarily be in the same place. So if you have a few student monitors helping you, that's a really big help. So we encourage that, that, that uh, you really need to plan your whole course out and to make uh, ways and think about ways to be inclusive, to be participatory, to, to have active learning approaches because it shouldn't just be a spectator sport for those people who are watching online, but they need to be included in there. So how are you gonna do that? So there are ways to do that, but you need to plan it and think about it ahead of time. To use breakout rooms, it's really uh, something that is highly recommended and to use it for paired work or a trio or larger groups of four or five individuals. So we do really uh, recommend that. And as Andrea had mentioned earlier, having someone in line with um, one or two people, three people, whatever, uh, one person in class, two or three people online, all in one group together. And uh, as long as the people in class can separate themselves these days in uh, COVID, they're already separated themselves and they can speak into their own microphone. And it's a bit like a hum in the background when, when just as in a regular classroom, you've got breakout rooms, you've got group work going on, you hear the hum and the buzz but then you can hear also your participants who are online with you. Find ways to hear from everyone in the class. And so one of the, just a, a one little strategy, it's not a big deal, but uh, it's an idea. Call on students whose first names begin with the letters A to E, as an example, to answer the next question. So you'll get people who are online as well as those in class. And then obviously you'd go through the alphabet and figure, figure it out. But that's one way to make sure, because if you have large classes of 40 students, it's probably not realistic that everyone's going to have a voice that particular class to speak. But you want to hear from both groups, those people in class with you and those online. And then to also look into the camera, not just look at your students, because inevitably the camera's on the side or not quite looking uh, right where you're at. So, but just remember periodically to also look into the camera as I'm doing right now. I'm not looking at my screen. I'm looking into the camera. I hope you will see that I'm looking at you. That, uh, and this is something that we need to learn as presenters in all, all manner of uh, occasions. And consider ways to change the voice in your classroom so it's not only you. Um, and, th and this is, I'm sure many of you are doing these things already, include videos or simulations, have a guest speaker, do an interview, have presentations, just uh, change things up a bit. The other thing I would like to mention right at this moment, these are best practices for all teaching. It's not just best practices for commodal teaching. PowerPoint slides, here's something very specific though to commodal teaching. With your slides, if you convert, if you're using a smart board, if you convert them to a smart notebook, then you can actually write on the slides on the smart board while you're in class. And then if you save that document, then you can share it with your students afterwards. Remember to take breaks in the long, long classes, obviously like a three, two to three hour class. Just remember to take breaks. Some, some teachers kind of just want to drive right through, but it's tiring to be online. 
it's tiring. Uh, you know, we all need a stretch. So just a reminder about that. The other thing is that we found that, you know, have some fun, take some risks, try something new and go slowly. Do one thing new every class. Don't try to reinvent everything all at once. It's going to overwhelm you and, and you might not even do anything new. Just try one thing new every class. And then ask, uh, ask, survey your students. Ask your students, what could I do better? I'm trying this new, it's new for you. Some of you are online this week and you're in, some of you are in class. Next week, we're going to change that. Some of, you know, you'll change positions. What could I do to help you have a better learning experience? So, and they, they have good ideas and they'll be willing to share with you, especially if you're open to their suggestions. And then at the end, our last uh, recommendation is really a community of, of practice for Commodal, where teachers can share their experiences, their notes, their handouts, their uh, ideas and suggestions. And then we can, uh, you can also survey the students and we're recommending that you survey them throughout the semester if your institution is going in, in this direction. So I believe I'm out of time. So I'm just going to go really quickly here um, and we'll do our questions and comments at the end in our breakout okay. session. Thank you so much, Wilma. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, You're Andrea, welcome. Therese and Wilma. Uh, we will uh, uh, ask questions in the breakout rooms later on. Uh, you have the choice to go into any breakout room that you would like. Uh, but uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Eva Mary Gers from Bishops University. And uh, she'll be speaking about teaching and learning online in higher education during the COVID pandemic. Who did we leave out and can we do better? Eva, take it away. There, can you hear me now? Am I unmuted? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm not going to share my screen because I hate the way Zoom won't let me see faces when I go into that modality. And so I will use my and slides. And as a way, I, I, would, I would encourage everyone to turn on their cameras if you feel comfortable to do so. I also had a question about time. I thought we had 15 minutes, but is, is it actually? Um, so you have till 2.55. So we only have 15 minutes? Yes. Just setting my stopwatch. All right. So teaching and learning online in higher education. Um, I guess one of my driving questions was, well, who did we leave out and can we do better? But I was definitely taking more of a retrospective look at um, what, what was in the literature that could have helped us do a better, more effective job overall. And partially at my university, I was at Bishop's University. So of course my experience was specific to there, but many of the factors that came up there were happening everywhere. And um, so I, I wanted to look at sort of um, what, what did we know over the last, you know, there's been a robust online learning literature since the 1990s. There's been a robust distance education literature going even further back. For any of you who had correspondence courses in the old days, I learned Latin by correspondence, for example. So um, it's, it's been there for decades, but it didn't seem as if many people really were recognizing that in the institutional shifts going on. And I understand that it's a pandemic and it's a crisis. So of course, it's very different than if you were doing it normally, but at the same time, I was a little bewildered at how little the literature was drawn on. And um, it, I do know though, there were mitigating factors. So in, there's been some articles that came out during this time and also work previous work during, um, I think in South Africa, there were protests that shut down the schools at one point and people wrote about the pivoting to online learning, remote emergency teaching, they tend to call it. Um, in New Orleans with the floods, there's some work that came out of that period where people wrote about how do you go online during a climate change crisis. And so that, that literature helps us see where the more robust literature isn't effective and how it is different. So I wanted to acknowledge some of those differences first, that emergency remote teaching 
it's done in an emergency. <laughs> it's not actually the way we want to do things. However much some people now wish that's the way we do things, that's not what was happening. It's done because we had to. So it's an emergency. It's not done in the same calculated way as it is when you decide like Teluk has had online learning for decades. Well, they did that in a very systematic calculated way and they planned their courses that way. Um, many of us were teaching courses that have curricular objectives set by the minister. You know, they're set above us. We're told what we need to manage to have taught in different courses at different times. Um, and when you're in that kind of program, I teach in the School of Education, it's a certifying program. You can't just say, well, this course won't go well online when you have to go online. But in a normal experience, you would be able to say that. You'd be able to say, this is a very poor choice. We didn't have those choices. For the most part, some of the art people fought back. And, but for the most part, most of us were forced into modalities based on public health measures and, our, and the institutional decisions that were made. So it's not the same as normally when we go online or normally when we plan these things out. Another big difference is that faculty didn't get to self-select for this experience and nor did the students. So many students who would never want to take an online course were suddenly taking online courses. And that definitely had a big influence um, and the faculty also. So um, we, we just had to do it. And one final difference that I think is worth mentioning is that people are students and faculty. We weren't just teaching online or learning online. We were living our whole lives online. And that was very destructive for any of us who sat through numerous meetings with people who would say, I've been in five Zoom meetings or I've been in five team meetings. We know how much that slowed down the meeting we were in. Because when people have been online for 12 hours, they are not as effective as learners or as employees. And so a lot of people ran through um, from meeting to meeting. Many online students were stuck many more hours than you would ever plan out for any human being to actually be online. And then they'd go off and see their family online. So that's also different. Still, nonetheless, there's a lot of literature that I think could have helped guide some of the institutional decisions that were being made and would have helped perhaps, and I'm hoping that in future pandemics, as the young people like to say, in the next pandemic, um, we could do better if we remember that there's a lot of literature that's already being done, that it's not all new. So to start with just looking at the distance education literature really briefly, some themes that have been studied over the many decades that distance education has been studied. Um, one big issue is attrition. The dropout rate is much larger. And that's with students who chose that modality. And that really needed more attention from the communities that I was in, that people were going to drop out of these classes <laughs> and at a much higher rate. And one thing that institutions seemed to do was say, well, they can drop later. But I know many students who paid fees for courses that they never once attended, where they never once logged into our learning management system, Moodle. And I think that's an unethical practice when such an emergency is going on and you don't follow up on the students. At one meeting I was at, they said, well, the faculty can tell if they've logged into Moodle. And then, and I'm like, and then what? Oh, then we can email the students. And I knew people teaching a hundred students and looking at Moodle and then trying to reach out to those students would have been very, um, a big workload for instructors. And even in the 1980s, I was, um, or that was 1990s actually, but even in the 80s too. But in the 1990s, I was part of a team at Concordia that did this cool course. It was all cutting edge back in the day. And we didn't even have synchronous online learning. We had this you know, um, first class. We had an old system, an old computer conferencing system, but they put money and paid someone who not only actually, they would sit in the office and they would email students, but that didn't work back in the day. Every, no one was hardly on email. So they would phone students. They would cold call the students and they would remind them that they were in a class. And yet somehow in the year 2020, 
we didn't think that was kind of important to do, to reach out to students who hadn't logged in um, beyond email, which is meaningless to a bunch of students who aren't listening to their emails and weren't responding to them. <laughs> So that was one thing I noticed was the attrition rate and how we didn't seem to understand that there was a lot of literature about to how, how to help people not drop out of an online course, or if they are going to, how not to pay for a course that they never took. There's also a lot of literature about motivation in distance education, and there's so much I can't even delve into it, I tried to practice this talk and I was like, oh, there's too much literature, but there's so much literature about the motivation. And some of it shows that students who are more organized, who have more developed metacognitive strategies, they're going to find it easier to be online, either distance education or online in general. Um, but other students are going to struggle in that environment. And these students didn't get to self-select. Um, so, um, another motivating factor is if you've taught graduate students or professionals, some of them love being online because of the flexibility, if they have small children, if they have busy work lives, then being online is worth the cost. But if you're a typical undergraduate student um, of a, you know, the younger undergraduate students or a CJEP student, these are not motivating factors for most of them. And so our populations at CJEP and at Bishops, where we have a young population, um, these are not the people most motivated by going online for their courses. Another big thing that's been studying in distance education is the role of the instructor. And that varies a lot, um, depending on which type of DE you're doing, what type of online learning you're doing, but the role of the instructor and how that can be perceived and, and whether you want active learning or not, which fits in with this conference where we want more active learning, but that would be a different role for the instructor than perhaps envisioned by some of the institutions at, at stake. And finally, one thing from the distance education literature that's been talked about a lot is workload. And I remember back in the day, they were like, we are going to save so much money. We're going to have bigger classes and students will have the same experience. And it's really a myth that works for a certain type of distance education, very lecture based, but there's still a lot of upfront work. Um, but for much of online learning distance education, it's more resource intensive in terms of the instructor time. And I felt that was something that seemed to be propagating around me, this idea that, oh, it's not a big deal once you do your videos. <laughs> I'm like, well, if you do videos, but even then that's a huge amount of work instructors were faced with in a rather challenging um, time. That's just distance and then for online learning, and it's sometimes hard to distinguish those two at this point, but in, in the old days it was easier, but there's many flavors of online learning, um, just as there's many flavors of distance education. And some don't involve much interaction between students, um, but some heavily rely upon intensive active interaction between students. And so there's a big range from sort of a self-paced course where you work a lot with the material as a student to a collaborative asynchronous or synchronous learning environment. And there, there's such a broad range that when it gets lumped together, it's really unfortunate. So when people say, oh, this is good for this, but actually these modalities suit different instructional approaches and the research speaks to different implications for all these different flavors as we actually we're seeing one flavor talked about in the earlier talk. And that's one flavor, but then it, you turn to other flavors and different things hold true. And so the research speaks differently to all of these different kinds of modalities. So um, one important aspect of the literature that many of you may remember is um, back in the day, there was a big argument. And actually back then they thought TV was gonna be a major instructional technology that was gonna revolutionize everything. And there were a bunch of studies done where it was like, if I do this course online or I do this course face-to-face -face, and they'd compare them. And eventually the literature was like, you know, that's just not really the right question because it's not the modality. It's the interaction of the modality with the instructional approach that you can actually study the impact of. And there's been robust meta-analyses done. Bernard et al. at Concordia did, did a couple of these, looking at the literature and trying to 
to analyze the modality plus the instructional strategy and the impact of that. Um, there's no one right way to do online learning, but once you have a choice, there's different implications. Some institutions tended to make announcements, certainly at mine, there was one phase where they were like, this is the way everyone should do it, which seemed to completely ignore that there's many ways to do it. It depends on your learning objectives. It depends on your teaching approaches. Um, some are more flexible than others. Some are more active than others. And there's tensions between those things for students and faculty, but they all have pluses and minuses. And the literature shows that. Um, so I am running out of time soon, I knew I would. Um, so some example myths that I heard rampant around me, um, one of them was that classes in higher education can take advantage of the mix of asynchronous and synchronous. So um, at my university, one of our choices was to meet online one time a week and then post asynchronous work, sometimes a lecture, sometimes other things. And they would then say, see, you can flip your classroom. And I felt as if they totally forgot about the instructors who don't rely on an information transmission model of education where we don't have lectures. So when they kept using this terminology, flip your classroom, you can do it. I'm like, flip what? Where? What do you even mean? And it's just a kind of prejudice in our system where they privilege the idea that a bunch of what you do is just lecture to people. And so you could do it this way, just that's the best way. Um, another myth I heard was that this, and this relates to the previous group actually, is that it's no more work for the instructor to just have some students log in off, offline. You just do what you do face to face. And then there's this group online and you don't have to think about it. And I'm like, uh, actually, the research shows it's very complicated as the group discussed. You don't have equal access to the instructor. The instructor has to design the course for one modality or the other. Um, if the class involves active collaborative learning, it's very complicated. And the other group went into some of the details of it, but I've done it and I had a pregnant student and a student with a newborn and another student at a remote distance. They got their own little group online. And I've done other courses like that. And it's super hard to help have the group online participate in the same way when you do group work in your classroom. And one thing the literature says is you absolutely should have someone present there to help facilitate the online group while you do the face-to-face -face group or vice versa. So imagine if you were doing that and there was actually a facilitator, not, not a technology expert, a facilitator who was actually able to help teach the other group. Um, but that is not what happens as far as I've seen. Oops, that means I have one minute. Um, it, it, it's not the norm. And yet the research is really clear about this. And, um, and another myth that I saw running around was that synchronous online learning, where you just log in at the same time all together, that's going to be more interactive than asynchronous online learning. And people forgot, I think, that there's lots of people who do asynchronous online learning that's highly interactive. And um, there's also asynchronous online learning that's not. Um, in, the, in the first generation of distance education, it was sort of a student material interaction, correspondence courses. In the second generation, we, we sort of added in a more robust student instructor interaction. But in the third generation, we went to adding in student student interaction. And synchronous online learning tends to fit really well with sort of the second generation. But for the actual student student interaction, as there's many, many problems trying to run small group work online. It's great in one way, but it's also extremely challenging compared to face to face. So I personally found it very difficult and yet wanting to do active learning, I tried to do it. But in fact, the research shows it's not straightforward. You can run from breakout room to breakout room, but meanwhile, your students can be extremely off task and you can't really keep up with them the same way the teacher presence in a classroom, even though some people are off task, you don't think that all your groups are shifting their focus all the time. And so many, many students experience the negatives of this, even though we were doing our best, but 
it's a problem to think that, oh, I'm, I, I can only do group work with my students if I'm online at the same time with them, when actually the literature shows many ways to do asynchronous online work that's very interactive. Um, I really am running out of time, so I'm gonna have to jump ahead. There's a lot of literature about different features to make interactive asynchronous learning work. Um, there's a lot of literature about mixing the modalities of synchronous and asynchronous offerings. I was chair because I thought it would be fun to be chair in a challenging time, but I did not expect the pandemic to last. So, ha, very funny. But one thing that amazed me was I would have students who would say, well, I don't understand why this course is so much work. They thought if the class met once a week, it was half the work and they were frustrated by the other half of the work. And I'm like, it's a three credit course. So I realized the poor students and the poor faculty who were dealing with students who were like, I don't understand why there's this asynchronous part. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of um, problems with motivating people in a synchronous online world also. And I'm sure many of us experienced the students who were running their lives in multiple different ways while in class. Um, being ghosted by students who logged in and pretended to be there. I, I heard a lot about ethics of not making students turn their cameras on. And I'm like, well, they may as well not be here. Because when your camera's not on, where are you? Um, and, and at least online, and this was an early thing that came out in the literature, if you don't post online, you don't exist. So a student isn't present ever unless they actually post a message in a computer conferencing system or a learning management system. But just as in face-to-face -face learning, they just sit there. The difference is you can motivate them when you're there face-to-face, -face, whereas in Teams, they would have some of them would just have their cameras off and I'm like, who knows what they're doing? Paying their bills, fighting with their significant others, dealing with their animals. Uh, who knows? Um, many of them were not doing what we thought, which was actually participating in a class, and yet they were marked as, quote, present. Um, so there's different motivational factors for all of this, but what surprised me was not trying to explore the literature. And in the end, when I say, who did we leave out? Well, I think we really left out the new students. I think it was much easier for students who were already established in their communities who had better effective being a student skills. Um, indeed, the inequities were further advanced during COVID in this educational setting, just as they were worldwide, um, country to country and within our communities. Um, it was another way that higher ed privileged the people who were already going to be successful. And it, Sorry, it just started you're running out that. of time. All right. And then the other person <laughs> I think they left out were the instructors. Um, many, many instructors did not get the kind of support that was needed. There was a lot of technology support, technology concerns, but we had to do this all on the fly. Um, I haven't yet found somewhere that gave course reliefs properly during the fall semester, which is telling us we have all this help for you. Well, I need the time to go get that help versus giving me a course relief, totally different story. And the literature says, if you want instructors changing their courses to go online, you need to give them release time to do that. But that was not something that really happened. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eva. That was wonderful. Uh, very thought provoking. Uh, we will get to talk to you more in your breakout room. Uh, we have our final speaker, uh, Rita Yu, and uh, I think her co-author is not here today, Jane Lebron from Champlain, um, Regional College, and the title of the uh, the title of the talk is a reflective exploration of our COVID pandemic teaching experiences. Rita, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Rina, and thank you, everyone, uh, to be here. Um, the talk itself is uh, focused on our experience you know, as we listen to Wilma, Teresa, Andrea, and also Eva. Um, it seems that during this experience the whole pandemic honestly we put a lot of uh, pressure on the teacher so myself as a sociologist uh, kind of wondering what's going on right and I think that by turning the lens back to us as a teacher we can do some soul searching and just try to see uh, how far we have come to since the beginning so may I share my screen and um, we will continue from there 
So can you just let me know if you can see my screen? I can see it all right, Frida. Lovely, great. All right, so uh, in this presentation, a whole sociologist team prepared it. So not just myself, but also my other co-author, Jane is one of uh, the co-author. We also have Susan, we also have Chabelle, we also have Ian. So um, all sociologists have participated. So a little recap, it's a context that we were quite familiar with. Uh, we are still living through it. Um, this pandemic hit us uh, more specifically in Quebec uh, is more March uh, 2020, last year. And during that time, all of a sudden, we switched to emergency online delivery. So something that Eva has talked about. And then afterwards, we continue with online delivery model in fall 2020 and also in winter 2021. So all these time, uh, we have been delivering our course online. But as she mentioned earlier, designing a course online requires a tremendous amount of time. And so uh, that option was not given to us. You know, we were kind of have to do it on the fly, you know, as she said it. So what happened is that we all face a, a challenge, not only to redesign this course uh, completely for some, uh, because the course was originally designed to deliver in person. But now we have to switch everything uh, to a virtual, virtual platform. And for many, this is a new technology, right? Many of us never had used Zoom before. Uh, many are just exploring the MS team. Uh, there are other stuff that is uh, proposing, popping up at that moment. And we all tried it. Other than the delivery platform, we have to redesign our assignments. Uh, we have to rethink of our evaluation, assessment, and even classroom management, but virtually. So all these are quite uh, challenging and it all happened at once, right? So what that means is that a lot of us are at the situations that not only we need to think a lot, we also have to learn a lot. And at the same time, we are constantly seeking improvement because we know that uh, this technology may not work uh, for this group of students, so we switch to another technology, right? Uh, for example, uh, back in the days, at the beginning, we communicate with students via Mio, you know, one of the learning management that we have in Champlain College. Uh, but that's more an email style. But when the pandemic hits, these students can no longer bump to us in the corridor or even come to our, uh, just jump into our office hour to have a quick questions. So. Now we need to find something kind of like the something to replace this this experience. So with using MS team to the chat function uh, allows us to do that. But other will find other ways to to kind of keep a quick connections with the student to kind of replicate that experience. And this is just one example of how much we have to adapt to that situations. So what that gives me and all my fellow sociologists is that hey we have to not just redesign, we not only adapt, but we also have to reflect on everything. Teaching practice, decision-making, classroom management, uh, teaching philosophy, and, and, and the future. So what's gonna happen next? Because we don't know how long this pandemic will last. So this brings us back to the teacher journey, right? The reflective part. And without knowing it, all of us are joined to get back to this journey once again, right? Reflective teaching refer to a core aspect of teaching practices where teachers seek to self-understand, uh, reflect on the past classroom actions. So in our case, more like try to replicate that in-person experience into the virtual classroom and try to improve from there. Assess individual practice, so the way we deliver the, the lecture, uh, maybe we have to go even more animated you know, as we deliver online lecture because we try to capture students' uh, attentions, right? And we also, once again, examining the concept of learning and the way that we teach and that way and try to seek more development in it, right? We are all visit all these at once during that 
pandemic, you know, back in March, right? Because at that point, I remember vividly last summer, many of us uh, participate different types of webinar just to explore uh, how to use Team, uh, how to use Zoom, how to use different uh, platform, or even get better knowledge about yeah, about Yahoo provided uh, platform and also YouTube or Facebook even. So this experience brings us, all these sociologists in Champlain College, uh, two questions and we want to explore further. Like, what does it mean for us as a teacher in this whole experience? Because during that time, our focus is to deliver the lecture as student focus, try to get things done. But what about us, ourselves? So with that, we come up with a couple of questions that we want to ask ourselves. We want to know uh, how did we experience through that, that year? So these are the five questions that you asked ourselves. Um, what we have learned from our faculties, um, even what we have learned from our students, right? Yes, they are students, we are teaching them. At the same time, I think they have something to offer too, right? Um, what have we incorporated into our virtual classroom? So what we, we done, how many practice modality that we have tried before we find one that suits ourselves the best, right? Uh, what does it mean to have innovations in teaching to us too? You know, is it all about technology? But what does it mean uh, once again? And what is our future? How can we move on from here now? So with these questions in mind, uh, we kind of make it a little bit more methodological. So we use uh, our own network, which is on MS Team. So we gather all the sociologists, we create a channel for this specific discussions. Uh, we pose all these questions in our channel. And then uh, more specifically, one question per conversation. Later on, I'll have an image to show. And that way, when teacher reply the question, they can just simply hit the reply button. Right? And then afterwards, we will uh, go through the reply. Uh, we identify common themes and then we talk about these themes of course we will have a virtual meeting on that and then as we discuss we document it so it turns out this way we give us a way to analyze the content that we have created uh, as well as to create a more focus group discussions on specific topics so this is one of the snapshots uh, of our discussion. So you can see me right here. So this is the question that uh, we pose and then Jane, she replied and then other fellow teacher can reply and they can always get back to add more. So that way it's a little bit more organized too. So once we uh, answer all these questions, we gather them, we discuss them, and we find out that there are five major themes that comes back to us. And in the past years, this is the five things that we are constantly bounced back and forth. So the theme of communication was identified in the faculty discussions. Um, the theme of connections is identified when we talked about students. Uh, and then the theme of collaborations was identified when we talk about virtual classroom. And then interestingly, when it comes to the question four, innovations uh, in teaching, as we thought that we would have talked about different technology, it turns out to be something else. Right? It turns out to be uh, compassion. So uh, we finally decided to use this word to capture that. And then uh, the last question, which is the future is about considerations. It's not about different um, modality that we want to deliver, but it's considerations. So these two are quite uh, interesting for us. So here are the quick summary of each of the theme. Um, for communications, when we talked about our faculties, uh, many of us agree that uh, during this time, there's lots of supports. There are lots of collaborations. There are lots of solidarities and sharing happening uh, within the teacher communities. And this is very uh, encouraging, right? 
these two are the quotes, direct quotes from the answer. So I'm very thankful for the guidance I have received. I appreciate the openness and the support. Um, the sociologist who, who wrote this quote was a newly hire to teach, right? Think about that. You just got hired and you are teaching in online. You just have to flip it uh, in like a matter of like a week, right? It's, it's impossible without this community for that support. Another quote that really touched me personally at the personal level is that um, this person wrote that the teacher sharing their struggles has been very helpful. It's not about tricks. It's about their, the difficulties, the challenge that they face, you know, because that once again brings us to recognize that, oh, we are all in the same boat. So we are all dealing with it. We are all advancing it. So it actually makes it more comforting and actually this will allow us to open more, to ask questions, uh, to, to seek advice, right? So this is very uh, important for us. So when it comes to faculty, certainly this high amount of communications and the support was clearly uh, the, the, the main thing for all of us. And I'm sure many of you do share too. To continue, uh, for the second question, what we have learned from our students, um, we identify connections, right? Of course, there are other uh, themes comes up. So for example, other than connection, we do have compassion, curiosity, resilience, understanding, openness, adjustment, patience, etc. cetera, right? Um, one quote that it's, these two quotes really stands out. Uh, the first one is the resilience, you know, the challenge that they face, the importance of being heard and understood, uh, having the connection with the student and be honest with our own challenge. So this teacher not only identified the strong part from our student, but also try to connect the student and be very honest about each other's challenge. So that way, without no way, we are connecting with the student and create and imitate that classroom relationship that we lost in this online platform. The other quote that we have here, you know, students have taught me the importance of compassion, simplicity and routine. Uh, this is very important, I find. And they are able to recognize that the shift to online learning has been a leap for everyone and therefore all participants must exercise patience and trust. And there's more room to be vulnerable Oh, once again, I find that this quote, it stands out because of that humanness part, right? Once again, we acknowledge our difficulties. We acknowledge that not only us have difficulties, but also students. Earlier, Ava mentioned that uh, she has students who are pregnant, who have kids, young kids. And honestly, I myself have young kids in my family. And when they're at home and I'm trying to deliver a lecture, it's quite chaotic, to be honest. You'll hear people banging behind the door, right? That is my vulnerable part because I don't want students to hear that. And of course, this is a non-issue if I'm in person. But it is something that we have to deal with, not only myself now, but on the student side too. So I think it's good that we, we have that connection with students to admit that, oh, we all have difficulties. And that once again, brings us that connection um, to a greater, uh, stronger level. When it comes to the third questions about our virtual classroom, um, we identify collaborations. Um, each of us, uh, use different methods to facilitate uh, the classroom uh, management and also the material delivery. And uh, we, in the discussion itself, we do not find any very um, similarity when it comes to uh, the way we deliver the course. Some teachers have a synchronous, asynchronous session, but with the asynchronous sessions uh, dedicated to a specific topic assignment, uh, whereas we have other have videos uh, with audio videos, other will have PowerPoint with audios. So we all have different style when it comes to delivering uh, the classroom material. But what stands out in this um, questions is that we all try to collaborate with the student by finding what is the best for them. So this also echo uh, earlier presenter talks about the different modality. We try to find something that works for them. 
Okay. So one teacher have said that I have found that I've changed my approach in order to give the students a bit more flexibility in pacing their learning. Because once again, we do not know uh, what are their challenges you know, on their other side. Another teacher actually, we've changed a bit more. She mentioned that uh, the focus is more about learning. It's not about the grade anymore. It's a, more about keeping them going, uh, keeping hoping that they will develop a more autonomous, uh, study habit because many students uh, in Sejap, they are younger. Uh, for many of them, it was their first year. It's very hard for them to be motivated and be autonomous at that young age. Well, some are a bit more mature than the other, but once again, it's challenging for them. So instead of focusing on just the grade, uh, we, the teacher, we flip it completely to learning focus. So the assignment was designed it and the, uh, the whole lecture was designed based on learning. So that Sorry, way- Rita, I just have one minute left. Sorry Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. So the collaborations become one major part of it. The fourth theme is uh, compassion. Uh, once again, when it comes to innovation, it's not about the technology, it's not about the modality, but it's more about what best suits for the students. So by thinking in their shoes, putting ourselves into their shoes, uh, helps us to be, to dance that delicate line, right? To choose the strategy that is applicable for us, it's not too overwhelming for us, and also not too overwhelming for them. So thinking outside the boxes is quite important. And the last thing is the considerations, which is our future, right? At this point, it, we just announced that there's a possibility to go back in person classroom in September, well, but yet things are not 100% uh, sure. So being flexible, it's very important, but to be able to flexible, first thing is we need to be able to consider the possibility out there, right? So, here, one of the quote is simplicity can produce deeper learning experience and more time flexibility for the student. So once again, we try to find something that is in the middle that is good for them as well as good for us as a teacher, because if we are not well, how can we teach uh, properly and deliver the course properly? This one is very long, so I, can, I don't mind sharing my uh, PowerPoint afterward, but since I don't have many time left, so I will not read it out. So what comes back is that our experience, once again, reinforcing the idea of reflective thinking. Um, it, this reflective thinking, as is shown in our process, require critical thoughts, uh, self-directions, problem solving, and uh, also it require our personal knowledge to ourselves and self-awareness. And many literature have talked about that. And to wrap up our experience is that we found that as a teacher, uh, we need support from our group, not only our department, but as our, in our community. But at the same time, we have to support them too. So we cannot just take and without giving. Um, we will need to certainly have to, once again, identify our student challenge by constantly thinking from their perspective. Uh, that way it helps us to enhance the relationships. And of course, by constantly critically think about and access about our own practice, it refresh our own teaching practices too. Maybe we can add new aspect into it or try new modality, you know, that things that, and explore things that we do not know that we could before. And once again, it anchored the teaching philosophy that we originally set it at the beginning of our career. With that, also we find that uh, during that experience, many students did express that they feel that they are being heard. So students not only learn from the material that we deliver, but they also learn from our attitude too. Okay? Uh, the attitude of, uh, our, of course, the material that we deliver, but also in general learning, you know, what does it mean? You know, uh, there are, especially for those who have difficulty to follow this online, uh, learning uh, with your enthusiasm, with your persistence, with your resilience, it actually transmitted to them as well. 
So therefore, our own attitude is very important. So to become a better teacher, often we will have to, to switch our positions you know, to the learner perspective. Not just I know the material, I am the expert. Well, of course, in this pandemic, pretty much throw everybody out uh, off the boat in a way. Um, but have that learner perspective, you know, it's very important once again. So, and this is something that we should continue. And at last here, it's just something from us to you, is that we teacher, um, not only need to support from, but also we need to support to our community. Um, this learning community is a space for us to share uh, and reflect our practices. And this community also needs all of us to foster and to make it safe. Uh, it is very important to make it safe because we are like students too. We have our own different. We are all vulnerable in our own way. We have our own challenges. You know, as I mentioned earlier, my biggest challenge, I have three young kids. They keep banging the door. But well, that is something once again. So without a safe environment, how can we exchange and how can we learn from each other and to have each of us are back uh, when and during a difficult time. And with that, of course, by sharing mutually and genuinely, honestly, we can grow together. All right. And I guess my time is up. <laughs> thank you so much, Rita. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, speaker. These were such thought provoking uh, talks. Uh, I would want you to go on and on about this. Uh, we still want to extend this conversation. Um, there are people in the audience might have questions for you. I have set up the uh, breakout rooms and according to the first names of the um, titles. So we have one on co-modal, we have one with higher education with Eva and then one with reflective uh, experiences with Rita. I'm gonna open up the room. So the speakers would be into the rooms uh, directly, but as the audience, you are free to choose uh, the rooms that you wish to be in. Uh, you just need to click on breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen and join the room that you wish to be in. So I'm going to start that already. And I will leave this room open till about 3.40 so that you have more time to talk to the presenters. And thank you for coming. And hope you enjoy the rest of Salties. <laughs>